we hit the Danny Kruger effect. It's basically when you start learning something in the very first like three, four months, you get this idea that you are now the best, that you know everything. And then all of a sudden you experience complexity and uh, that complexity, you know, throws you off your feet. But when we just figured out what we really love. We were always believe in the power of community and we realized that if we put this community thing as a foundation of venture capital and really try to make it work. So we invest as a fund. We have uh, 120 investors that subscribe to our fund. It's a rolling fund on Angelus, which basically means that every quarter that's a new vehicle and people invest similar checks in every vehicle. Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher and the founder of Impeak. My guests on today's podcast are Nick and Marina Davidov, partners in life and in their Silicon Valley-based venture firm, DVC. There were many reasons why my interest was piqued in wanting to speak with Nick and Marina. Their story as immigrants who arrived in Silicon Valley from Russia less than a decade ago and their achievements in such a short time span was one of them. But also, I like people with a point of view and a unique perspective, which Nick and Marina have no shortage of. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I'm confident that you will too. This is like, we are going to treat it like a dinner conversation. We just met at a dinner. I met you guys in Silicon Valley. I was really fascinated by your story coming from Russia, you know, how you built your venture capital firm. So I'm always interested in talking to people who have a point of view. And I think that definitely fits you because you, you definitely have a point of view. You have your very strong opinions in a lot of things. So first things first, Starting with the ladies first, Marina, why don't you uh, give us a quick overview of yourself? I'd love to hear a little bit about your story, how it all came together as a firm and, and uh, you guys working together. So take it away, Marina. My name is Marina, uh, Marina Davidova. Um, right now, we are writing together with Nick, my husband, Davidov's Venture Collective, which is a venture capital firm focused on early stage startups. Most of them are AI startups, but we are not limited just by AI. But it's interesting. I'm, 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 um, uh, looks like this is the case when uh, it can be the story from two different points of view. And I'm wondering how Nick will describe it. Um, we started working together since uh, we were 19, 19 years old, so a long time ago. Uh, we were trying not to work together. So uh, we also had different projects. Uh, my area of expertise and my background, quite diverse from operational staff, financing background. Uh, I also have law degree. So I was always trying to combine all of my interests and all of my uh, areas uh, that I'm experts in. And finally, we put all, all together and started this VC firm, which is a little bit different from most of the venture capital firms you can you can see on the market, but probably we can tell about this later. <laughs> yes, definitely. We are going to come to that story of how your venture capital firm is different. So Nick, tell me a little bit about your background, your story, uh, and then we are going to come to how the, the firm came together. I come from a family uh, of uh, scientists and uh, people, engineers who worked in telecom. My grandma was an aerospace engineer. Um, so I was always fascinated by technology, by new stuff. And uh, I met Marina in university and uh, immediately fell in love, spent two years uh, trying to get her. Uh, was probably the hardest, uh, hardest deal I've made. <laughs> that was I love really, that. really hard to win. Um, yeah, but now I, my, my playbook is, is full of things. Um, I'm just kidding that like those tools were only used once. Um, so we started working together at Cisco. I was a sales guy. I, um, hated being a sales guy, but that taught me a lot. I, I was, I was an SDR, so I was doing a hundred cold calls a day. Uh, then we went to get our master's degree together, got back, and, and then we got into startups. A lot of our friends were starting new companies, and uh, they invited me to help one. And uh, I was doing finance for them and um, a little bit of product engineering, and um, we're raising money. And 
we met a guy who was uh, a founder of a unicorn company back then. Uh, it was not a unicorn, but it was doing really, really well. It's called Kiwi. It's now public on NASDAQ. And uh, he wanted to invest. But then after, I think, three or four meetings, he decided against investing. But he he approached me with a job offer. He said, like, I'm starting a venture capital firm. Um, nothing is... Uh, Nothing is decided. Nothing is done yet. It's just an idea. But like, do you want to come and, and, and join as a first employee? And um, I immediately said yes. I called my boss the next morning, said that I'm not coming to <laughs> to work. And I'm going to just like finish all of my stuff in, in a week or so and, and, you know, pass it to um, other people. Back then, Marina was pregnant. Uh, we just got married. Uh, and... Uh, it was a it was a rough decision because they're basically building something new, um, like no salary expectations. It's just like building a venture firm from scratch in Russia, where there were very, very few venture firms. I think at that time we were like number five institutional VC firm. And uh it was just catching fire. Uh it was the time, it was about 2009, 2000, early 2010. Um I think Yandex was still not public. Uh, Kiwi was not public. Uh, I don't think any Russian tech companies were public, uh, Russian internet. And Mail Group was the first one to uh, to be going that way. And Yuri Milner was a huge inspiration. So he was doing a lot of VC deals in Russia. He introduced this concept that you can invest in a company and sign a deal on a single page if you like it. Uh, because his idea was that if if the company is good, then there's going to be an extra on the funding and uh, they're going to be like a big firm with, you know, fancy lawyers and then they're going to do it all right. But if uh, if it's a if it's a bad company, why waste paper? And uh, I learned a lot from that. And we had a few uh, LPs who invested in our fund who were backing Yuri Milner, too. And uh, like the, 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 this way, we uh, got a little bit opportunity to learn from like what they were doing, what we were doing. Uh, so we invested. Uh, we raised a, a firm with 120 mil under management. Uh, we invested in, I think, 18 deals. And we were very lucky, not only because we were, uh, you know, picking the right companies, but also we were just in the right place in the right time. Uh, so we picked a few companies that became unicorns. So two companies have become unicorns from that portfolio. Two, two more companies are like one got acquired at 500 mil. Another one is still uh, private, but probably around 500 mil valuation. So Really, really good portfolio. Very few companies got written off, actually. Like most of them got acquired. Most of them paid the uh, good returns. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2014, what, what happened is is, is, is uh, everything changed. Uh, so we were doing really well. I was uh, in charge of our advertising technology portfolio. And that's how I fell in love with machine learning. Because uh, ad tech was one of the first areas where people started using machine learning, like for search and uh, search ads. and uh, I was at the helm of a company that we invested in uh, called uh, Silpult. So we put together seven companies, merged them in, into one holding company. They put me as the group CEO, probably because my English was the best, <laughs> but I don't know why else. Uh, and uh, I was uh, I was doing a roadshow for I think about six months. I was I was doing a pre-IPO roadshow uh, to try to like get this company that nobody has ever heard of, but was making 150 million in revenue and like 30 million in net profit, uh, growing like crazy. It was basically servicing hundreds of thousands of small businesses needs for, for online ads. I wanted to put this company on the map, on the global map, uh, to get a reputable investor because we were one and only investors in that company. The company got bootstrapped to profitability, and then they basically offered to sell us shares because they wanted to go public. They wanted our expertise on, you know, how to how to build uh, how to build governance. And we got a really good round. Uh, we got a term sheet from Franklin Templeton, and they offered us like a hefty sum of money. It was both primaries and secondaries. It was almost a unicorn um, valuation. And and then and then Crimea happened. So uh, the Crimean referendum and Putin took Crimea uh, as a part of Russia, and uh, Franklin Templeton pulled back. That was like the first, you know, first signal. Um, we didn't give up. We kept fighting. So we uh, we found another investor uh, that would invest. That was an Italian group uh, together with a uh, with a Russian bank, uh, and um, another six months, and we were just about to sign the deal. 
and then uh, MH17 happens, the uh, the Boeing that got done by by the rebels, and um, basically this bank appears on the sanctions list. So the deal falls apart again. So we 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 decide against taking money from a sanctioned bank, uh, and eventually, Marina and I regroup and we're like, what is happening? What is what is what what is really the perspective here? So we try to look ten years ahead. We figured that Putin's number one priority is maintaining power, and this is a sort of a priority that basically sacrifices every other possible priority. So will there be a VC market? Will will there be like a free economy? Will there be you know like a Western investment? Probably not. And we were thinking that after this, like if we do this round, if we do this IPO for this company, we'll be raising our second fund, and the fund is something that you raise for like ten years. Do we want to build uh, something for ten years in in this environment in this economy with this trend? Probably not. So we decided, okay, we achieved quite a lot. We're in a very nice place, but it's probably a better idea to cut the like just to <laughs> write off the losses and start everything from scratch, just greenfield. And that we did, like a, we were very illiquid back at the time. So I'm like we're still people in VC are very illiquid. I'm like on paper. We're probably considered wealthy, uh, but in like in liquid cash, we 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 can you know barely afford stuff. Uh, so we we had maybe a hundred a hundred k. Well, it, that's not it's not like barely afford stuff, but that's like what was all our savings. And we're like, okay, so we're not gonna make any money for a while. So let's uh, let's do smart choices. And um, the first choice we made was to pick number two most expensive zip code in the US to move in. <laughs> <laughs> smart speaking of smart choices but actually it was a very smart choice because it gave us immediate access to some network to start building with uh with with with, with awesome people uh we got our daughter into school and uh when we went to one of the first school auction parties uh more just you know talking to people introducing ourselves like hey we're like nick and marina we do startups we do early stage vc and uh People would respond like, "Hi, I'm John. I'm like, I'm, I do VC. Hi, I'm Helen. I'm an angel investor. And like, hi, Mary. I do startups. And everybody in the room was in VC or an angel investor. And and we're like, wow. In Russia, we were like five firms and entrepreneurs, founders would come to us and would pitch us. And here, the whole thing is upside down. And we're like, wow. We gotta figure out." What what do we do? How do we stand out? How do we <laughs> how do we find deals that would take you know our money and that like we would need to if we build um, another firm we would need to get pursued investors first of all we need to pursue investors that in this environment this market were able to win the deals were able to find the deals because like all of our track record in Russia does not matter. And One of the magical things this? about 2015. Okay. So early 15, uh, and then we like finally moved with, with you know, like with kids and our dog in uh, September 2015. And uh, that was an incredible experience because it was super hard. Uh, I thought that we're accomplished. Well, none of our track record mattered. People didn't know the names of the companies we work with. People didn't know the names of the LPs we work with. Like our, um, well, a few of our previous LPs were, ready to back us but they needed a thesis they needed something like because you can just invest in, in in a couple and uh it was a hard time figuring out how silicon valley worked um but in three months time uh we hit the you know the dunning kruger effect dunning kruger curve is basically when when you when you start learning something in the very first like three four months you get this idea that you are now the best that you know everything that's a super easy. And then all of a sudden you experience complexity and uh, that complexity, you know, throws you off your feet. But when we just figured out, uh, when we, when I thought that I, like, I know it all, uh, we found an app uh, that was looking really, really good. It was an app that replaced your face with a mask. What basically they didn't replace it. It put the mask on top of your face. And uh, it was a very new app. We had 500 users. And uh, Marina just returned from uh, from a Vipassana, 
So we were going through like very, very hard times. Morena tried to pass on for the first time. Um, was very hard on her. Um, and uh, but she came back and and she she talked to me and she said, Hey, so out of all things, out of all projects that you're trying to run at the same time, trying to make money, what is the single one that like makes you happy? Like makes you go. And I was like, well, this app is like it's it's super small. It's it's a toy. There are there like there's no money in it. There's no revenue. I, I doubt there's going to be revenue soon, but I just love working with the team and I love working with the app. So she said, yeah, like, uh, let's let's focus on this full time. And uh, we dropped everything we were doing. Uh, we put everything else on pause and uh, we just focused on this app and work with them. And the app uh, got got bigger and it got bigger and it got bigger. And in uh, three months, we were at 30 million users uh, and we were becoming like a worldwide sensation. That was a uh, masquerade used at the um, red carpet uh, for the Oscars. It was on Jimmy Kimmel live show. Uh, it was uh, it was in the news daily, and and then uh, Twitter approached to acquire us, and and then Facebook, uh, well, not approached. And like I I figured that if Twitter wants to buy us, there must be other companies. So in order to get a better price, we need to create a competitive timed process. So I started trying to find, you know, ins and outs in um, Google, Facebook, other companies trying to talk to people. Uh, I think out of first 10 contacts I made in, in Facebook, uh, first 10 said no. Like, why would we want to talk to you guys? You're like a small startup. We're a huge corporation. And then number 11 said, hey, actually, I'm a big fan of the app. And I think I know who, who would want to buy it, like which team would want to buy it inside of Facebook. So it's funny how that really taught me a lot. Uh, that, you know, every time in a corporation, you cannot really speak to the corporation. You can only speak to a few people in the corporation that have fragmented knowledge. Because number, if, if I didn't, if I gave up after like 10 times, we wouldn't get that deal. And and then eventually that got to um, uh, their corp dev and, and their corp dev was tracking us. And uh, Zuckerberg was was a user. Um, and and they acquired Masquerade, and that basically gave us this. It really gave us this uh, foundation of where to build from, because all of a sudden we had a deal in Silicon Valley that everybody heard of. Uh, we we had some local names that people recognized, and we finally got some track record. Uh, and the rest is history. Very cool. I love that story. And when what year was this Masquerade thing uh, when you sold it? Uh, March 2016, yeah. Okay, so so literally within about a year or so since you came, so uh, that's uh, that's a massive success. So Marina, you mentioned that you were going to tell us a little bit about the point of view, how you guys are different. What is it that makes your uh, venture capital firm different? What's what's the unique thing about your approach? Uh, yeah, uh, the first of all. In spite of the fact that we both like have similar background with Nick, uh, we both have financial degree and business degree, but still we have like similar degree. We have super different set of skills, and also we have different like point of views on a lot of things. So after this success of Masquerade that Nick mentioned, we thought that okay, looks like we are here in Silicon Valley, and finally we cracked how it's working, and we understand everything. So the truth was, it's not. <laughs> uh, it's more complicated. And uh, after this success, it was a long road of learning some fails and minor successes. It was a like full cycle of venture from when we're trying to learn, okay, how it's working. And uh, based on all this experience, we realized that we are right now on this incredible time when everything changing is so fast and more and more people getting involved into the venture capital. And venture capital was always like a power that can like push things and move, like set trends. But right now, venture capital is democratizing because more and more people with no like focus just on venture capital involved in it. Uh, more more angels, more founders investing in other founders. 
um we were always belief in in the power of community and we realized that if we put this community thing as a foundation of venture capital and really try to make it work so we really try to make work how community can really help startups probably that would be something very important so so tell me more about how you are building that community is it is it like you you thought we were going to build a community of all the founders that we have invested in and bring them together where is the community is it how do you bring the community together is it is it through events or or what else so i would say like our our vc fund based on like a couple of pillars so the first one is there uh, as as i mentioned there is a community and the second one is our um is our approach how we build in so we have seen our venture capital firm as a product so we all have like we have the similar metrics as a products in a startup so we're trying to iterate um look through lots of hypotheses in the way how we're building it and Nick, can you say a little bit more about community so I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about how it came together because it it, it is not something that we dreamed of. It's it's a it's a result of an evolutionary process where uh, it it kind of came came out organically. So in between Masquerade and now, we also did another company. Um, like and then we raised the fund and then the fund uh, did pretty well and then we sold the fund uh, because we uh, were not agreeing with with our partner on like where to take it next. And uh, we started a, a company. We started the startup. We so we were founders for four years, uh, raised a bunch of money. I think total was like sixteen something million, um, and uh, the company got acquired after uh, after we raised Series A three times. A company called Cherry Labs. We did uh, we did AI cameras that understood what people do in video, and uh, after all that, we were thinking, what do we do next? I'm like, we got a bunch of money. So we have maybe like three, four years runway in Silicon Valley, uh, which is, I mean, like a lot because it's, this place is damn expensive. But we have this, you know, safety net that is gives us huge privilege because very, very few people have it. And we like we we came from not having any safety net. And we figured that it gives you an incredible ability to try new stuff that would otherwise be too risky to try. And I was thinking I'd be mad at myself when I'm old that we haven't tried, you know, crazy stuff. So I, I was thinking maybe space foundation, something like this. And we turned to what we really love and what Marina said is building products and also investing in startups. So how do we combine both? We're like, my first idea was that like, let's do, let's do a product for VC firms that we, that, that would, they use to, you know, like co-invest with each other. So something let's, let's figure it out. So, um, I started talking to GPs of other firms. So we talked to, I think about, about a hundred GPs trying to just, you know, like friendly talks, not interviews, not, you know, ask your mom kind of stuff, but, um, we're trying to figure out what is their pain. And what we figured out is their pain is that they are the bottleneck. They're, they cannot scale themselves. So basically every small firm uh, performs better than bigger firms because it's easier to deploy money and then you can really, really focus on finding winners against deploying. But every small firm wants to become a big firm so management fees are not tied. And then as they become big firms, they get institutional LPs that are not very useful for investing in early stage. And these partners are very lonely in terms of like, they are the only ones who carry the burden of, you know, helping the founders uh, with everything. And they take the ultimate responsibility. I mean, like, and if they're successful, it's not really their success is, is the founder's success. We're like, how do we, how do we solve this biggest bottleneck of, uh, VC partners being not scalable. How do we scale a VC partner? Now we would like either, and how would do we feed scaling VC partners within like a small amount of management fees? We would, we would need to find crazy people who would want to work for free or like nearly for free, who would spend a lot of time on helping startups who would have an incredible expertise, like level of expertise that they would either be very, very good engineers or very good product people or great investors. 
we would need like very skillful people to work nearly for free and spend a lot of time on helping startups. And then, you know what? We figured that there are people like this. There are actually uh, 643,000 people in the US that do this. That is the number of angels registered uh, on AngelList. So we were like, okay, angels are the best investors. They just don't have the leverage of a toolbox. They don't have the, you know, they don't have analysts. They cannot really do like 360 due diligence. They're usually very, very good at doing due diligence in like one area where their expertise lies. They don't have the leverage of capital. They cannot pull more capital than they have. And, and then they don't have a community. So why don't we like keep doing what we, what what we're doing and that at that time we were basically investing like Marina and, and Nick plus friends investing in startups just on autopilot because this is what we've always been doing as angels uh and then i think we one one deal we wrote like 20 checks into one company uh from from different angels because they would approach us and say hey i trust you a lot like you are finding great deals just bug me when there's something i can do personally for this company but like otherwise, just like feel free to send me invoices. <laughs> like we'll, we'll uh, just send me uh, the wiring details, and like I'll basically invest every everywhere that you invest. And then we figured, how do we make it institutional? So this is this is how we we came. So what Marina said is that it's a product, and it's a community uh, of angels who are incredibly helpful to portfolio startups. And these angels, they they become uh, venture partners through bringing in new deals or working with existing deals and that we we share carried interest with them so like the whole thing works more as a collective other than a company i love it it's it's such a um such a great story so tell me a little bit about um, that angel community so, so not, right now are these angels like co-investing with you or so you have your lps that's separate but you also have a community of angels. So, so one of the things that you are basically is giving you leverage is that you say once you in, choose a, a startup to invest in, you also have a network of angels uh, that uh, are co-investing. Is that right? So we invest as a fund. Um, we have uh, 120 investors that subscribe to our fund. It's a rolling fund on Angelist, which basically means that every quarter that's a new vehicle and people invest uh, similar checks in every vehicle. So mm -hmm. let's say let's say there's an engineer who works at Netflix uh, and invests in startups, like uh, you know, like, like supporting founders, um, is helpful with uh, recommending more engineers. So they write us a check, uh, like would be probably 30, 40,000 bucks um, uh, a quarter. Uh, so like 120, 150 a year, and that would be like their uh, total investment with with the fund. And within every quarter, we would do seven, nine, uh, sometimes 15, like last last quarter was crazy deals with startups and uh, follow ones into startups that we already invested. And then we would look for clues of how can we be helpful to the startups with our community uh, based on their um on on their updates. So Marina's built this beautiful system that basically, uh, looks into um, whatever our portfolio companies are uh, telling us and tries to use um, GPT-4 to figure out how we can help. So it looks, um, it has this context of all, all of our LPs expertise and helps us pick who to approach. And then we approach this person and say, hey, you might be able to help this company with this and that. Do you want an intro with the founder? And then, and then we approach the founder uh, and say, hey, did this LP really help you? And if they say, yep, they did, uh, then we share a little bit of carried interest with that LP. I love it. Um, so on that note, actually, uh, just like how you guys use GPT-4 or like all the different tools that, that you have used to essentially help a smaller fund become almost as powerful as you know a bigger fund in a similar way it strikes me that uh, a lot of startups come to us looking for investment because we are building this big network of investors so they come to us and say um like i have this idea and i want to raise money for it. and a lot of times when i look at 
their idea, I feel like in many cases, they can definitely get to an MVP without any initial investment or minimum investment. And then when I look at like how they can grow, it, it seems to me that the need for funding, it's probably not as much as it used to be. Like there's so much more that you can do with technologies that, with the smaller teams. Uh, but, but in many cases, startups come to me and they still have the same mentality of the, the kind of like, like I asked them, how much are you looking to raise? And they're like, oh, I'm looking to raise three to five million, you know, and they don't have a revenue event. Um, so talk to me a little bit about your observation of, is it true? Is my observation true that I feel like people don't need as much money to build uh, interesting, profitable startups? And, and then if you think that is true, then we can talk about what is the implications of that for venture capital. Um, but uh, yeah, first, first things first, is that observation true? I do think that your observation is true, uh, but I don't think it's new. I think it's it's just the, the industry is getting back to where it was. And if you remember, uh, I, don't, I don't know if, you, if, if the uh, listeners uh, remember, but the first batches of Y Combinator, they were investing uh, there were first money in. They were investing in companies that had, uh, you know, like two founders and the dog and a, a little bit of ambition, and they were able to get to their first revenue. And uh, that was normal like then. Now, well, not now, like two twenty twenty one. Y Combinator would be investing in a company that has already raised like their pre seed round, and they're still pre revenue. And uh, I think a bunch of things coalesce there. So first of all, um, engineers and like getting employees became super, super expensive in 2021. Everybody was trying to fight for workforce. Google and Microsoft and, and Facebook were paying crazy amount of money. So there was like, there were startups uh, that were focused uniquely on how to hire the best engineers, uh, how to win the competition for the best engineers. And, and now it's no longer the case. So like now we're back to, let's say 2017, uh, where it's it's a little bit more normal where you can start building something and then you can, uh, because the technology is moving so fast that there are always new opportunity windows opening for, you know, small teams to get into something and get their first revenue and that get their like first couple of customers before they have to raise anything. Uh, AI makes it all possible not only by you know uh, giving people tools to build uh, because everybody is suddenly way more uh, productive, but also by constantly keeping these new opportunities uh, open. So this this is a really, I think it's a nice vintage for startups. So companies that were started in 2023, 2024 are probably going to be massively successful. Uh, I think Fortune 500 is going to be dramatically different in 10 years. And a lot of companies that were started today will be members of it. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. Um, so when people come to us and are looking for 3 million, 5 million to get started, I will show them this video, right? <laughs> this, this interview and, and say, look, maybe you don't need that much. So what is, um, tell me a little bit about the, the, you know, how, how you see things unfolding in 2024. So you, you talked a bit about, you know, how 2021 was was different. And, and maybe Marina, if you want to ju jump in here and, and talk a little bit about that. 2024, what's the outlook for startups? Are, are we finding a middle ground? Uh, you know, 2021 was crazy. Um, I raised at that time uh, and, and things have changed quite a lot. So, so is 2024 going to be, Better, worse than 2023? Um, I was recently talking at um, Venture Summit in Boston. So there were a lot of talks about how the market is finally invest in investor favor. So uh, not, not so found founder friendly as it was before, as it was in 2021. Uh, but like, I, I came from Silicon Valley, where all this AI boom is happening. And um, I wouldn't say that it's uh, so friendly for investors right now for us. <laughs> We're still competing. Uh, we still see these huge numbers and uh, crazy evaluations. Um, it was nice to see how it's different outside of our Silicon Valley bubble. So we still feel that we will have this 
financial constraints. So um, startups will still have to practice financial discipline, um, do more with less, focus uh, more on distribution and yeah, like iterate faster to actually to, to, to find their product market fit and to find their audience. Doesn't matter like what industry it is. With AI in which we are mostly working on, um, I would say we still have, we see that like some of the startups need more money, three, five millions just in order to start. Because like, um, especially when you're doing something with a huge research, uh, you need more resources for that. So the trend will continue, but don't feel that their interest rates will, will go up. It will stabilize probably on the same amount. So it, it, it will dictate uh, the, the market conditions. I, I would say we will continue the trend that we had in 2023. We probably with like more fate <laughs> that it's going to be better, but it's, 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 it's going to be like difficult year for sure, is in my opinion. <laughs> A difficult year mostly for startups or for investors? So for both, because the, the market is changing and we had to align on uh, lots of things. Uh, and we have actually both as investors, we also have to rethink the way we are doing things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so as we are coming towards the end of the conversation, there's, I have so many more questions. But one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the future of venture capital going to look like in about say five years five to ten years because I, I just have this sense that maybe things are changing so radically that maybe in the next three five ten years it may not look the same like to a point that maybe the industry may not even be there quite the same way that it is right now because of the fractionalization of technology and the fact that you wake up in the morning and there's like some completely radically new technology that has come up that that makes it possible for people to develop products and services in ways that are really different and also uh, then there is the big corporations but you know then then you you get something like open ai comes in and, and like completely wipes out so many things like when i think about a lot of products and services in technology that i used to use or that I still see out there. I see more and more a centralization of those in that, uh, you know, the big corporations like Adobe, like Amazon, Google, et cetera, that they are going to compete with each other, integrating these technologies into their products and services to a point that there's almost not a need for like a smaller products to be developed. So I don't know how that impacts uh, the future of venture capital. Do you think that venture capital in the next five to 10 years will still look something like this? And if not, what what would it look like? I mean, I know that you, obviously you don't have a crystal ball, but but like, do you ever sit down, like when do you meditate, go for a walk and think, you know, what's the future of venture capital going to look like? <laughs> We're constantly thinking about this because uh, every time we raise the fund, it's uh, 10 years into the future. So we need to figure out like what, it, what this 10 years are going to look like. Uh, and of course, we don't have a crystal ball, but we were, as you said in the beginning, we're opinionated people. Uh, we do have an opinion that people, founders will always want to build new things, start, co start companies, build new technologies. And there is no better way to distribute innovation. There is no better way to back founders as, um, as venture capital. Venture capital will inevitably evolve. It will become something something better that is better aligned to help companies grow, to help support them and grow bigger. Maybe it's going to be more entrepreneurial. Maybe it's going to be more backed by the incumbents, the companies that are already out there, like Google and Facebook and you know Nvidia and Meta and Microsoft. Um, maybe there's going to be some convergence of the two. Uh, wouldn't know. Will the 220 formula go? Uh, be like 2% management fees per year, 20% carried interest, probably also going to change. There is a huge wave of uh, venture builders coming in. There's a huge wave of exactly. uh, solo GPs. There's a huge wave of like duo GPs. Uh, but what, what happens right now is that small GPs inevitably want to institutionalize because 
like it hurts when you lose a deal because they don't have a brand name, because they don't have like a team, because they don't have resources. You see other GPs have a large budget, you know, sometimes even for things that's like uh, making awesome parties and, you know, big, big events. And, and then you're like, oh, we're, we're having to, you know, uh, we're having to be extra scrapey to, to be that efficient. And everybody wants to become bigger. So maybe the, the formula is going to change and there's going to be budget without compromising the amount of capital. Because basically what I don't like is that you have to deploy more capital to have a bigger budget. And that does not translate into more uh, returns for the, for, for the investors. So something is, is probably going to be very different, but I think the industry is going to be there and the industry is going to become bigger and better because it's the single best way to distribute innovation. And yeah. the, innovation, the pace of innovation is just all just speeding up. Yeah, I've noticed so many venture builders and I want to come to that. Um, but um, one of the main questions I have here is about the exit strategy. Um, so I, I was listening to the All In podcast. I'm a big fan of that. I don't know if you listen, but these guys, um, they're talking about how because of the Adobe Figma issue recently, that there is more and more we are in a position where that um, exit through mergers and acquisitions is becoming harder and harder. Um, and therefore, one of the only remaining ways for venture capital to, to achieve a return is through IPOs. But the market cannot support the number of IPOs that are needed for, for all of these venture capital firms to recognize. And more and more, it's becoming possible for companies to become profitable, but not necessarily profitable to a point of not necessarily becoming big enough to be IPOable. So I think. Yes, for the founders, they could still get to a place that are that they are profitable. But, but how does that translate into uh, an exit for venture capital? Um, so this is where I think the venture builder model is very interesting. And I think that eventually I always see myself going into a venture capital. And, and I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to you know build something that is more like the venture builder uh, model because with that, even if there is no IPO, there is ways that you can bring back return for your LPs. What's your thoughts on on that statement? Venture builders, I think, are a very peculiar model. So basically what it means is, is when you um, take a bunch of founders, give them resources and build with them. And uh, venture builders are usually founded by successful founders. Uh, it's a model where you have a bigger concentration and bigger conviction. So you're, you would spend more time, more money on a fewer deals, but you would have a bigger share in them. Then venture builders have a very um, big problem. It's like uh, whenever they have a company that is VC backable, VC investable, they would need to walk back their shareholding and either spin it out and give more shares to the, to the CEO uh, or the founder of the venture builder has to abandon the venture builder and join the company full-time as the new CEO. And then basically the shareholding makes sense. Because to make a company investable by VCs, you basically need a very um, specific way the cap table is formed. Because nobody would invest in a company on Series A that has less than 50% of shares belonging to the founders because like on series, by Series C, people would be like, oh, that's the, the founder lacks motivation. Um, so that's that's an interesting thing. So eventually, what happens because of it is that the, uh, venture builders produce more profitable companies, produce more companies that are okay, but fewer companies that are incredible. Uh, whereas the VC model is more fine-tuned to be looking for potentially big wins for home runs. VC is a home run business. So if you score a home run, a company that returns your fund 5x alone, then you can keep building on top of it. And then you can, um, and then basically uh, raise other funds and then you can keep investing in that company, like from like side vehicles, follow on vehicles, opportunity funds, and just like make more money for the LPs. So what I think is gonna happen is that um, VC builders are going to be 
exclusively focusing on portfolios that are maybe like 10 strong, 12 strong. And then VC funds would be more focused on investing like 100 deals at an early stage and then trying to figure out like which ones they, they want to find, uh, they, they want to fund more uh, in, in order to find these outsized returns. I, I would, this is actually exactly what we were talking about, that like the world needs diversity in terms of everything, diversity in terms of models, approaches, um, in terms of how VC firms can, can be built. Is it like a venture builder or things like our, our fund or like more classical one? Um, similar way uh, startups could be could be very very different but the like, different products need different models we haven't answered your your question on the exits though yes please. i strongly yes. disagree with the, with with the statement that that the founders say that it's harder to sell a company than an m a uh it's just harder to sell to google it's just harder to sell to meta but the, because these guys are constrained they're under scrutiny. They are under scrutiny. They cannot buy like Google used to be used to used to buy like 150 companies a year. Like every other day they would buy a new company. Uh they can't anymore. Well, Apple is still buying, but there's a whole new league of companies that are looking to acquire. First of all, there's Fortune 500. Yes, they're less fancy uh to work for, uh, but they're paying good money. And then there are more companies that are not paying good money yet because they're small, but they're very fancy to work for. The new player of growing companies. I mean, like Perplexity, our portfolio company, has acquired. We got it. We get. We got in, onto the cap table because they acquired one of our startups. They're already acquiring, and they're incredibly fun to work with. This is this is going to be the new um, league of Google's and Meta's of the future. A hundred percent. Yeah, that's super interesting. That's that's a great observation. I'd love to see. Um, I mean, I am working on getting Chamath uh, from uh, All In on, on the pod, and I'd love to hear his reaction to that, because um, as I was listening to them, it sounded like, you know, uh, that they were really kind of worried about like what's happening to this to this space in terms of mergers and uh, acquisitions, because um, the governments are putting more and more of a kibosh on, uh, you know, uh, allowing these to go through, and and it's it's making it easier, and that the IPO is going to be the only uh, uh, the only game in town, and and it's not going to be um, possible for everybody. Well, very interesting perspectives on on everything. I learned so much. You know, it gives me a lot of uh, food for thought, and I'm sure it does for other people too. Super interesting. I really appreciated your your time, your uh, perspective, and I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you to uh, you know uh, hang out every time I come to Silicon Valley and and uh, follow. Oh, your let's journey. hang out. Yeah, definitely following your journey. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you so much for doing this. This is incredible. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Nick and Marina Davido. Be sure to follow them on LinkedIn and stay up to date with their content and progress. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcasts so that you don't miss the future episodes. It will mean the world to me if you leave a review and share the podcast with others that you think might find it interesting.